All right, so we're live. Uh, it is Monday, 1 p.m. Welcome. Welcome back, Richard, to the Startup Business Q&A. Episode 63. It's been almost a month because, of course, I had an operation. We are live here on uh, Facebook. We're also live on YouTube as well. So I uh, hope that you guys can watch me there uh, without any hitches. Let's just see uh, after it's all completed. So um, first off, you expected it, but I wanted to say this anyway. Uh, look, thank you for everyone who's given me such amazing um, well wishes the last uh, three weeks or so. Um, this time, three weeks ago, I was completely under uh, the knife and I had an operation. And the good news is I'm healing very well. Things are looking really good. So I've started coming back to work and uh, getting my strength back and a bit more uh, a bit more energy and certainly starting to get some weight back up as well because laying on a bed for a long time does uh, does take it out of you. So um, great to be back and there's no reason why we won't be continuing this as we were every single week. So 63 episodes this will be and um, thanks also for those of you who've sent through some questions uh, for today's session. So we're going to keep it reasonably brief. I'm not going to go crazy uh, just because my energy levels are only so much at this stage. I'm still kind of still in recovery. So work in London's not going to be happening probably till next week uh, just because stamina is a bit of an issue when yeah, when I've been, uh, I've got big holes in my stomach where, uh, where I was cut open and things. But anyway, if you're having your breakfast, I'll stop there, right? Because we'll put you off. So let's kick off. So look, first off, uh, first question here is from Lewis Clack. He says, um, is it wise to think about future exit strategy for your startup when you start it? Or should the aim not be to sell the company, but to keep it profitable as long as possible? Um, right, exit strategy is important to talk about. Uh, something that's not brought up that much, actually. You need to be clear with yourself why you're starting the business to begin with. It depends, of course, because with some businesses, some people build them with a view to having an exit strategy. They want to actually build a business they're going to sell. Some people are serial exit strategists in that they regularly do this. They either join a company and build it so they, can be, so they can exit or sell it or something, or they build businesses that they can then sell on. If that's the case, I'll just turn it off. If that's the case, then what you need to think about is that, sorry about that. what you need to think about is that you've got basically uh, the important part of building a business is the start and putting your, you know, your all of your love and attention and passion into it. And if that's the case, why would you want to sell it anyway? So this is a bit like the question when people ask about um, investing. I should get an investor, shouldn't I? Shouldn't I be courting investors? How do I speak to investors because I'm building a business? You don't have to have investors if, you, if you're building a business. And in fact, sometimes it's not a good idea. Likewise, you don't have to have an exit strategy because selling your business for 300 million quid is what you want to do. So many times people have great businesses and if they are worth something, it doesn't mean you cash out because you now can live on the golf course or something like that. You've got to start thinking to yourself, why would I want to build a business that's worth so much and gives me so much pleasure to then go sell it? It depends on you. It depends on so many different things. So if you're the kind of person that's going to intentionally build a business to exit it, well, then, of course, you need the exit strategy to start with. Just don't think about things like that. Build a business. That's the better thing to do. But with a caveat. The caveat is that as you build a business, it's intelligent to act as though it is bigger, more mature, and in a position where you're going to need to court investors or potentially a buyer. So if that's the case, you've got to think to yourself, even on day one, what things do I need to do to keep this house in order so that it becomes attractive in the future? It doesn't mean you're going to sell it in a particular time or date. It doesn't particularly mean you're necessarily going to... Uh, sorry, I'll just get connection here again. Uh, but YouTube so you should be able to see me still. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to uh, sell it at all. But what it does mean is that you need to be very careful about, um, you know, overdoing this thing. It's an additional possible thing you might do. It's not necessarily something you definitely should go into because... I suppose what I'm trying to articulate here is that you may get to a point later on in your in the building of your business when you decide, actually, I'm not going to do this um, and I've changed my mind. And your mind will change a lot when you're building a business because that's just how it is. And so if that's the case, you just need to be think, thinking to yourself, I can't call it for when I'm 
two years down the line. Don't think about an exit strategy, is my advice. Focus on building a business. And then as long as it looks good, you know, in, in the sense that you've built a business in a, in a robust, intelligent way that it means it's attractive for people, well, then we should be in a good place. But otherwise, just think carefully about that. Um, I'm just going to pause here because Facebook's uh, having issues with um, going live. We'll make sure that we come back on. Hopefully YouTube is working okay. Good. And we'll post again. This is what tech does to you. That's fine. Go live. Let's do it again. And YouTube should be fine. Cool. So in a nutshell, don't worry about exit strategies when you're starting a business. But as you build a business, make sure you're thinking to yourself, is this attractive for someone if they were to buy it? Because it's not all about building a business, then cashing out and making a billion dollars, because you may well not want to do that. It happens all the time. When people have great businesses, they try to get buy it bought, and they say, do you know what? I don't want to sell it because it's a really great business I enjoy. And, you know, it might be that you do sell it. Instagram might be that you don't. Snapchat, for instance, you maybe decide not to. They could. They could make more money. They could go and sit on the beach doing nothing, but you're probably not built that way. Let's move on to the next, uh, next question. So sorry, I was trying to do technology while I'm answering that. So hopefully it's clear enough. Uh, Kyle Patel, when using an outside source for something performance-based, how can I find a good way to measure their performance over time if I do not have any performance history? For example, am I hiring a marketing I am hiring a marketing company. How do I know if their results could be better or if they're above and beyond? This is a great question. For startup people, when you're starting to work with third parties, you just don't have the experience often. You just don't know how to call it on measuring their results or performance. So what you do is first, you don't go to people who have, haven't got a clue. You go to people who know what they're doing. Don't go to one person, go to three, right? Okay, I'm going to get marketing services from a, from a marketing company. Never ask for one person to, uh, you know, uh, to pitch you. Ask for how many there are. When I got my web developer recently, I, I courted loads of people. And then I picked one that I felt good about. And what you do is when you ask, when you interview them, you say to them, right, if you're going to work with me, then what kind of things are you able to de deliver as measurables, you know? How do you normally deliver, a, a, you know, give me an example of how you provide measurable results. And this is this, you know, what well, this actually is, is, is a really good technique for selling and for engaging and in business in general. If you don't know the answer, you should ask. Don't say it's because you don't know, because you're giving away your hand then, like you, you're completely green. But it's better to say, do you know what, I'm unclear on how you can show me measurable results. How would you go about proving to me if you were the marketing company I take on? How would you prove to me that you are the guys I should be working with because of measurable results? How could you prove to me that I'm getting a return on my investment? What metrics would you provide? Or even say, can you give me some examples of the kind of things you provide to other people? You ask three different marketing companies, Kyle, that are pitching you for that, you know, to have your business. Um, they'll give you the answers you need. And then you decide which ones you want. They'll give you a good gauge, and you tend to find that that's the way to do it. Because if someone knows what they're talking about, they'll be experienced in providing those metrics. So if you don't know, there's a good way to do it. But you're asking me. So a good way to measure their performance over time is also to make sure at the very start you're crystal clear with them, as in you've agreed with them, precisely what things you're gonna be measuring. Okay, so what I'm saying here is saying, right, on the, Day one, we'll be doing this on week one, week two, month one, month three, 100 days, whatever you want to do. These are the different objectives and milestones we're going to have because you must have that in place so that you can say, where, where are we against what we're trying to do? Because it may be, and this is a suggestion, by the way, maybe that you work with a marketing company on the basis that there's some kind of a probationary period. I've done this before with service providers. I've said, I did this, uh, in fact, um, with uh, a Facebook advertising uh, business uh, in the past. And I said, you've got one month, so 30 days. Here are the things I'd like to see, you know, have as objectives. And if at the end of the 30 days you've achieved it or exceeded it, well, then we'll continue. But that gives us 
in no uncertain terms, we're clear that you've got a one month trial to prove you can do this because you don't want to have a difficult conversation and then say, well, you didn't ask for that. You need to set yourself up so that you can continue or not continue based on being happy with the results. But get them to uh, to tell you first what kind of things they give you would, would give you in terms of measurable results. What I would strongly suggest and certainly don't settle for the first company you speak to. It might be that they're great right it might be that they're the perfect company and you got it right first time happy days you get lucky sometimes um but it's better to go and interview a couple of others because you need that that the kind of uh, comparability it might be that you say do you know what the first people i interviewed it, these guys prove that they're right or actually wow i was going to go with that first company in fact they're no good this second one or this sixth one was far better so if you're going to spend money with marketing company make sure it's a good one as with anything uh, in terms of services. So I hope that that helps, Carl. Uh, Devon Scott, thanks for your question. You've asked, when you're still managing capital, what is the best way, if there is any at all, to establish a fair trade of services with potential partners? Um, so, so in terms of managing capital, I, I'm trying to decide for this. My understanding is you're saying when you've got your pot of money to start up with uh, at the beginning, how do you um, establish a fair trade of services with potential partners? I think this is a way, a way you need to look at this. Your capital is a very precious thing, and it should be there to invest when it's a hell yes moment. Okay, so people spend their capital; they just spend it because they think they should. But I think there's there's a, a process that should go in ahead of spending the money. It's kind of about it's about being tight, but it's about being it's more about being calculated on how you spend it. So here's what I'd suggest. Always, always act as though you have no capital. OK, so have have that idea that you're working without capital in your mind. And if you act as though you haven't got any, you tend to find that you find ways for trade of services with potential partners to work. Um, I've done this so many times in the past because and I think no matter how much money you have, coming in in your back pocket or whatever it's still wise to have this approach anyway so if i was a billionaire i think i'd still take this approach what it is is saying why does it have to be money not because i don't want to spend it but why does it have to be money is there a better way of servicing this person you know is it the case that actually their services they can provide me are comparable to me giving them my service or something along those lines in fact would they see greater value in having access to one of my services which in terms of a cost if you like in terms of cash flow isn't going to hurt me as much because it's maybe a pre-made product or something like that and cost is absorbed or something like that so giving them one of my products or services in return for their services may serve to completely eradicate the need for capital being spent in this transaction altogether i do it all the time it may well be that you say how about if i give you this and this amount of money as opposed to the full fee because this way you're you're keeping your capital intact for when you may really need it when you get that opportunity wow i need this right now it is definitely going to make be a game changing rather than hemorrhaging money across time because you feel for a service you should pay act as though you don't have any capital and imagine in a barter economy which is really what this world is moving towards in some spaces i really believe that in this kind of ecosystem of providing services what do you have that you could provide that could help them it could be something completely outside of your business it could be something else but what could you provide them with that might offset or completely uh, you know, um, cover the the actual value of the services they're providing. So I wasn't entirely clear on your question, but I hope that um, that, that makes sense, uh, Devon. And if, if you need more, more detail, then, then do pop in uh, a comment for me. Thank you. Um, next question here from William Simmons. My question is, how should we as new entrepreneurs go after business? There's loads of approaches. And look, you might be great with Facebook ads. You know, um, I know some guys who are epic at facebook ads and their answer to this would be always with facebook ads but as a new entrepreneur going after business my strong suggestion is because you should be in the habit of doing it even when you're no longer a new entrepreneur is one-on-one -on -one, is is engaging with people directly when you start 
you cannot sit back and expect people to come to you. You can try Facebook ads, you will probably need to do a period of experimentation, but the thing that proves the best, uh, you know, inter most effective way of engaging pe with people is going out, networking and prospecting one-on-one -on -one with people. Putting out messages and content, and things like that, great. That can work when you've got a tribe, right? But when you're looking at the very first days, it needs to be one-on-one. -on -one. Perhaps you're on Instagram. Anyone who likes something, you find them and you say, thanks so much for the like. You comment, you know, you follow them, you send them a message and you go from there. Maybe on Facebook, maybe someone shared one of your, um, you know, articles that gives value about your product. Engage. Thank you so much. How are you doing? And get a conversation going from there. Always, always have you know, engaging people one-on-one -on -one in your back pocket. When the chips are down, your back's to the wall and you're in trouble and you need four grand this week because you've got something that's come up, you can't expect to be, unless you're gifted or great at it, in my view, you can't expect to be able to rely on anything other than yourself to generate that business. So be practised at the the actual biz deving of calling people knocking on doors or if you don't do sales if you don't if you just can't do that just engaging with people i promise because i've proven it and the monetize you course that people are starting to really talk about is proving it as well is that if you every day connect with 10 even or 20 brand new people say on facebook you will get responses look at it this way if you engage with 10 new people every day on facebook that's 300 new people that you've targeted in a month do you really think if you have conversations with them you wouldn't evolve get better and potentially generate some business that way yeah you can and there's a process to it monetize you is the way to look at it but but the you know that course covers it but the point is that that is how new entrepreneurs should go after the, uh, after the business. And that is sadly one of the few things that is missed the most. That is one of the things that people don't do. And that's a concern because it means that when things get difficult and I'm not saying, oh, look, there'll be a recession soon. But we had one. You'll probably get one again in the future. When you've got a hard time, you've got to be able to pick up the phone or engage with people. And it's good to get practiced at that. If you're doing Facebook ads, it's working great. What happens when, when or if something happens to Facebook? Is that it? What are you going to do now? So you need to make sure that one-on-one -on -one and networking, you know, as old as time, there is people interacting with people and services and value being given. And that's what you need to be practiced at doing. So that is not a rant, but this is important. You, you've got to be clear on that. Uh, let's do a couple more questions before we finish up. So uh, Leon Nandra has asked, with LinkedIn, how do you ask for internships or mentorships, et cetera, without being pushy or in a way to get a yes? Um, this is no, this is business, but it's no different to the social media. It's, we gotta understand is it doesn't matter what the platform is. You've got to look at the fact that you're still engaging with people. So if you're engaging with a billion dollar business or you're engaging with, uh, you know, a house husband with three kids through Facebook, it doesn't change the fact you're dealing with a person who will make decisions based on emotion, who have wants or needs. Sure, some might be busier than others, but you still need to make sure you recognize they are people. So the answer here is you provide value first, you give before you ask. How did I get uh, people through LinkedIn to engage with me? and provide me with content for my eight-step startup course a couple of years ago, for instance. How did I get business leaders from Amazon and Google and Microsoft or best-selling authors from, or columnists from the New York Times? How did I get them to engage and help me build my course or provide me with advice? I started, when I contacted them, I didn't ask first, I gave first, which may well be not value in the, I will do your copywriting for a month if you could answer my question for me or let me be a mentor kind of, uh, let me have, a, have you as a mentor kind of thing. It might be more stimulating emotional or intellectual levels of value I give. So perhaps instead of offering a service, I'm offering stimulating conversation without question. A reason why so many top people have responded to emails and calls and, and messages, say on LinkedIn, and things like that, when I've engaged with business leaders or entrepreneurs or just generally successful people is because I've started by saying, 
something like, you know, I, I was reading your book again yesterday, or I saw that you wrote a paper on this part of financial management um, in 2009. And in it, it said this, and I'm interested, that, you know, by giving stimulating value and emotional value like that, people are being compelled to answer because you're talking about something that was deep, deeply interesting to them as part of their world. And it's far more effective by a light year than being awestruck by this person and going, I think you're amazing. Um, is there any chance you would be my mentor? Because they get it all day long and it's boring. Be up at that level. Uh, don't worship that person. Be a, don't be in awe of them. Look at it as an opportunity to better yourself. Because really, high up people want to work with people who aren't going to smother them with flattery because after a while that gets a bit boring no matter how big the ego is what they would prefer is to have someone who's stimulating and on the level that's why you hang out with friends because friends make you stimulated or they should do they stimulate you or, or keep you emotionally sated and so what you need to do is say you know here's some value I've read your blog post and I feel this. That's how I got in touch with Seth Godin the first time. I read one of his blog posts and I said, I've been reading your blog for ages. You said this and I feel this, but how about what's your reaction to that? And I test, tested, I wasn't being difficult, but I asked him a question based on his work. And he was like, well, I think this actually, and this is why. And so we had a conversation and he asked me a question and I was like, well, how are we going? And then I was able to ask him something and get, <clears throat> get something in return to give before you ask it's no different it's how the world works and because it's how how people work hope that helps there's us uh, let's do one more question uh and it's kind of similar to the one we've had before but from leon again is there a tipping point richard for when you should stop pursuing a business venture i is knowing when to quit an actual thing and if so how do you know when you should stop pursuing something this is obviously really hard because it could be on anything if it's a case of saying I'm going to try and do Facebook ads myself. When do I decide to quit doing that and get someone to do it for me? You know, how much of a shot will I give this before I pass on to someone else? Well, what you need to do is think about what metrics you're going to give yourself. Because that's very different. How long should I run Facebook ads before I get someone to help me? Because I think I might be able to give it a shot to Stefan Schwartzman, when he, you know, when he was raising capital to build uh, Black BlackRock, the uh, the you know PE business, he was, you know, certain things. So like, I want, I need to raise a hundred million dollars in capital. I'm not going to give myself a month before I can do it. And if I can't, I'll give it up. It, that's a six month, op, you know, um, uh, window, for instance. So that's difficult. It depends, of course. But what you must do is commit to. I'm trying to be more practical here. You need to commit to what's called a soft deadline and a hard deadline. So if you're venturing into a new business, it's absurd, in my opinion, to not have at least some working knowledge of what you're doing. If you're like, oh, I'm just going to do something completely different. I haven't a clue what it's about. But some guy in that area has made a load of business. Then you're being an idiot. Right. You need to probably leverage something you're good at already or something you're half decent at. It's far more effective to say, right. What is it I can do? I have a working knowledge of. And on that basis, I, I can probably give myself a month, two months, three months. The reality is, this is the rule. You should always give yourself more time than you think. Because it will take more, more time than you think. Unless you get a lucky win, fine. But you will always take longer than you think. Therefore, don't quit early. Most people want to quit after two, three weeks. I know because I've coached people for years. It's like three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, six weeks of nothing even trying the right approach but they certain things just take time you know and so they give up because they're not got that great result straight away that it might be like do you know what you need to do three times this amount of time give yourself here's the bit of advice i was going to say give yourself a soft deadline first and then a hard deadline so you might say you know what after two months if nothing's happening then i need to seriously reassess this after three months if i've really generated nothing then I will stop, okay? And that's the way you need to look at it. Because yes, you know what? Some things don't just, don't work after a while. But you do need to be measurable. So write down, and this will evolve. It might be day one, you write down some metrics, and then day two, it's changed. Or three weeks in, you've changed again. But it, it's important to say, so what things am I going to measure? I want to have a tribe of this size. Really? Is that necessary? I want to generate this much revenue. I want to have X, Y, and Z happen by this week and then that week. 
but here's the thing if you don't give it everything then you can't uh complain about it not working out and a reason to quit shouldn't just be based on the lack of results a reason to quit should be based on a lack of results combined with your full commitment and no one can tell you if you've given full commitment or not really only you will know deep down if you could have given a bit more okay so the there are variables but you should have a soft deadline and a hard deadline okay you should have measurable results that you're looking for and you need to think about if you're genuinely going to be committing to this so a lot of people give up because they don't get results soon enough and it's probably more because they've not applied themselves enough okay you can't ex expect results straight away unless it's something you've been doing before and you understand it really well because there's going to be some feeling in the, in the dark and when you first decide to quit that is not the best time to quit i'll say it again when you first feel i want to quit it is not the right time to quit because that's your first kind of pushback usually you know go read the dip by seth godin go read tipping point because the thing is i, I hate this word quit I, i'm glad that leon's used tipping point then he's used quit <laughs> um <clears throat> Quitting is insane because what you've done is you're taking all of that knowledge and experience and you've decided to not use it. What you should be doing is saying, I'm going to pivot here, tipping point, I'm gonna, something will happen, maybe I'm going to pivot. If it's not working this way, I need to maybe try a different way. Don't drop everything you've done, refashion it and build into something else. Use that experience you've got, but don't just drop it all together. So quitting should never happen. Pivoting is a change of direction. OK, but never do it when you first feel that urge. Oh, it's not working out because when it's the first time you feel it, it's almost guaranteed to be just an emotional response to having a bit of a shitty day. So what you need to do is say, do you know what? We'll, we're going to push this another month. I've been going for two months and got nothing. I go another month and see how I feel then. And, you know, it's, it's, you've got to try your best. When you're going to make that final call on them, am I going to close, stop, stop this? Am I going to kill this baby and work on this thing, go in this slightly different direction? You've got to say to yourself, did I genuinely give it its best shot before I kill this off? OK, because it could if it could be great, then am I, you know, am I am I not giving it a best chance? And in addition, you must say to yourself, is this a decision? actually based on business logic or is it based on emotion because you need to think about how much you're being influenced by the fact that you're looking at all your friends around you doing really well maybe or people who were nowhere and then have overtaken you and you've got nothing these are external reasons that have no bearing on what you've been doing and you'll probably find if you make a decision to quit one thing based on how people are other people's performances um, you'll quit the next thing as well so don't do it based on that kind of emotion you need to be saying to yourself is this genuinely not working on a business level if it's oh i don't feel like it because i'm having a rough time well then grow up okay because you're going to have a hard time regardless do you really think people who are super successful ever are super successful just because everything's worked out of course not they're just simply more resilient and tolerant of stuff that's going wrong so that's some important advice there i'm going to finish with one more question there's one here from ben question uh, in business what would oh, there's a lot in there actually what would you do differently if you were to start over again richard um and there's a couple of things. I think everyone always says this, but your perspective changes as you grow. And my perspective has changed. If I look back years, my perspective has changed on how much I can do in a day. I can do more than you can always find another gear. So I work hard. I, I would work. I, would, I could work with greater intensity in the same number of hours that I work in a day. I would also go bigger. It's amazing how big you go. It doesn't really make a difference in things. I remember once when I was running running a business and I was used to originally on a previous company doing six to ten thousand pound deals, and then I did a hundred thousand pound deal, and I was like, actually, there's no difference at all. It's just that there's a different sum on the end, and I've given a, a greater level of value and a different product. So going bigger is a good idea, um, and I think um, I think those are the two main things. There's so much other things I would do, of course, but those two things are, 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 are there. I think in terms of anything else I'd do, I would 
probably bring more people into my ecosystem faster so people helping me out um i am not so much a perfectionist but someone who is uh i need i would like to be in control of things so when you give some work to someone else knowing that it's not going to be done the way you want to do it is quite hard to do but i think one thing i've learned over many years is that you bring people in and able to do a job that's mostly as good as you could do it that's probably preferable because of the amount of time you're saving actually so that's what i would say um anyway i want to finish there thank you very much i hope that answers your question ben i'm going to finish there with facebook and uh youtube i'll turn off in a sec but i just wanted to say look out for the new website it is www.therichardmore.com it's not live yet but going live very soon monetize you all of you guys who did the beta testing, I'm so thrilled that you jumped on it. Thank you very much for doing it. I will be offering 10 places this week, only this week, to people who also want to jump on the course. I'm getting such good responses from people who are now getting meetings, getting clients, they're getting so much traction and a good perspective on the sales of things. If you're unaware of it, Monetize You really simply is a very brief course that I've put together. It is seven different steps to leverage and monetize existing knowledge that you have, regardless of what it is, existing knowledge, rather than going to learn something completely new. So, you know, if I don't work in real estate, going to learn real estate in order to make a load of income uh, is a very long process relative to leveraging stuff I already have. And it's, it's basically working with uh, social platforms and in a very simple way, to the degree that I actually spell out the words you need to be using and how you engage. So the script, if you like, um, which works because my clients have done it and the beta testers have got, are getting results from it as well. Um, so 10 places will be available this week. Keep your eye out on my profile for that. And um, I will catch up with you all soon. But in the meantime, if you enjoy this, give me a thumbs up, give me a like. If you had a problem with it, no problem. Share and tell me why. I'll put in the, in the comments any other questions and I'll get to you as well. But in the meantime, thank you so much and I'll see you all soon. Bye bye. That's it for uh, Facebook. I'm going to turn you guys on here and finish with, uh, with uh, YouTube as well.